All right, wonderful. Well, it sounds like, or it seems like folks online can hear us. So I think we will get started and I, I believe folks will just continue to trickle in and that's fine. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing our guests today. Um, but first just wanna say good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the Berkman Klein Center's Institute for Rebooting Social Media, I wanna thank you all for being here and a big thank you to the Petri Fom Center for co-sponsoring today's event. Um, Gaia Bernstein is a technology, privacy, and policy professor, co-director of the Institute for Privacy Protection, and co-director of the Gibbons Institute for Law, Science, and Technology at the Seton Hall University School of Law. She specializes in law and technology, information privacy, health privacy, intellectual property, law and genetics, and reproductive technologies, and her scholarship examines users' interactions with new technologies across diverse legal fields. These days, we spend more time online than ever. Some turn to self-help measures to limit their usage yet repeatedly fail, while parents feel particularly powerless to help their children. Professor Bernstein's new book, Unwired, Gaining Control Over Addictive Technology, shows us a way out. Rather than blaming users, the book shatters the illusion that we autonomously choose how to spend our time online and shifts the moral responsibility and accountability for solutions to corporations and demonstrates why government regulation is necessary to curb technology addiction. Unwired provides a blueprint to develop this movement for change to one that will allow us to finally gain control. Thank you, Gaia. Good afternoon. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank the, uh, especially Tony Gardner and the Institute for Rebuilding Social Media and the Berkman Center uh, for inviting me and also the Patrick Flom Center who is co-sponsoring this. It was actually very important for me to have both center hosting this event because this book is in many ways about uh, technology and about public health. So many of you probably realize we use our technology a lot. We spend a lot of time online. And some of you may think that it's a problem. Some of you may have even tried to limit how much time you spend on your screens. And maybe some succeeded. My guess is some, quite a few of you have failed. <clears throat> maybe some of you tried to restrict others, maybe kids, and maybe complain that the partner is spending too much time on their phone. And did you try to convince them to spend less time? How well did it go? My guess is not so great. Now, some of you may be skeptics. Some of you may think, well, the ship has sailed in this, and this is the way we're going to live our lives. And maybe this is not so bad. So I want to start by talking about why I think this is a problem and why I wrote this book. I often, when I pick up books and I think, why did this person spend three, five, seven, ten years on writing this book, I want to know why they got started. So I'll tell you a bit about why I got started. And so I was one of these girls who liked to play video games. So I was hanging out with all the boys playing video games. And as I grew up, I really liked technology. I, when we just used modems for the internet, I was constantly connecting, disconnecting, connecting again. And then sometime around 2015, I felt that something was changing for me. I am an academic, I live in New York City, I often work in coffee shops, so I would go into a coffee shop and I would put my phone next to me and my Kindle and my laptop. And then I would notice that two and a half hours later, nothing was done. And I felt tired and wasted. And I thought, what happened? And I realized, well, what happened? Lots of texts to my babysitter, uh, work email, at the time uh, blogs were hot, so lots of scrolling from blog to blog, but very little work. And I started looking more and more around me, and I have three children, and I noticed that the world around them was changing as well. I went to birthday parties, and suddenly the kids were not playing with each other. The very same kids who used to run around 10 or 11 were sitting in front of the TV and were not even watching the TV. They were sitting, holding their phones, each looking at their phone. 
and I would go to shows, to school shows, but it was hard to see the stage. Why? Because everybody was holding up their iPhone or their phone. And I realized that I wanted to do something different. And I started the program through my law school. And that was 2017. And um, we went to schools. My law students went to teach uh, kids who just got their first cell phones. It was fifth and sixth grade. How to get a better online offline balance. I spoke to parents. And at that point in 2017, I thought, okay, people are not realizing there's a problem. Once they understand there's a problem, we're using our screens too much and it's not so great, they'll stop. So I stood up there and I spoke to parents and I had this list of self-help measures. Do not have phones during meals. Do not let kids keep their phones uh, when they go to bed. And every time I put the slide up, I feel very excited and take a photograph of my slide. And, and, and that's why we're going to write a different book, actually. It was not titled uh, Unwired Gaining Control of Addictive Technologies. It was about the power of awareness. How when people will be aware and how we can use legal measures to take, make people more aware, things will be fine. Well, as we know, things were not, did not go so well. So we know not much more. We know where the problem is coming from. There have been lots of reports from whistleblowers, Tristan Harris and Francis Hogan, who worked for Facebook and reported to Congress. And uh, we know that uh, technology companies are needed to stay online for as long as possible because that's a business model. We get Zero for free, we get Facebook for free, we pay, but we pay with our data. And that's something a lot of people have talked about. We also pay with our time. Technology companies need us to be online for as long as possible so they can target um, advertisers at us and collect more data and ask and then have us there to look at the ads. So, and how do they do this? Well, they hire teams of psychologists to target our most human vulnerabilities. So the internet is full of designs which are there to sustain this uh, business model. And I'll just give you one example. I'm sure some of you are more uh, aware of these designs and some of you may have heard less about it. Uh, so one example is about our stopping cues. So, there's a famous soup experiment. Uh, one group was given soup, a regular bowl of soup, and they ate the soup. And another bowl, uh, group was given a bowl where they couldn't see the bottom. So they ate 70% more of the soup. And they didn't realize they were eating more. That's what's happening all over the internet. Our stopping cues are gone. If you think about the infinite scroll on Twitter, on uh, Facebook, on Instagram, there's never an end to your page. You keep going and going. This is not an accident. You think on YouTube, autoplay, you know, one video starts, ends, the next one starts. Same on Netflix. You're watching a show, the next episode starts immediately. But they took away our stop and use. This is just one example. So I want to talk a bit about why I think this is a problem. Why is the problem that we're spending so much time online? And I frame this in terms of autonomy. And there are tons of definitions of autonomy, autonomy out there. I'm going to focus on two. First of all, the idea that we should uh, have the ability to reflectively make our life choices. Now, we never really, really made a choice that we're going to spend so much time online. The average adult spent five hours online. Kids, half of teens say that nearly constantly online. So the average adult spends five hours on their phone alone, not online. That would be actually better. So, and I think if you ask someone, do you want to spend five hours on your phone alone? Most people would say no. So how did we get there? We sort of got there gradually. Something happened around 2009 when we got smartphones and we got social networks and suddenly we could be connected everywhere. Now we didn't make this big decision of spending so much time, we made a small decision by adopting another app, another habit. For me, for example, 
I live in Manhattan. I commute to my law school in New Jersey. And I was thinking, okay, I don't have much time. I'm going to start texting my babysitters on the way to, to, to work. And then I thought, actually, you know, I can stop doing my work email, so I'll be more effective when I get to work. Then I joined Facebook because uh, I was a new academic and I thought I'll get to meet other academics in the field. Within a month of making what I thought were tiny choices, I no longer looked up from my phone on the train. A colleague could be sitting next to me, a student could be sitting next to me, I would never see her. So what happened was that we just made small decisions, each decision became a habit, but the, the way these technologies were designed, we end up spending much more time on each of these apps than we ever intended to. I did not think I'll spend an hour on Facebook a day, but I thought I'll spend five minutes every two days, but that's not what happened because these um, apps are designed in a way that keeps us there for longer. So in a way, we're a bit like the frog in the water, the famous fable of the frog in the water, because according to the famous fable, when the frog is in the lukewarm water, it can still jump out. When it realizes the water is boiling, it's too late. That is what happened to us. I would say that around 2018, there was much more awareness of the problem. But by the time people realized what the problem was, our whole life was connected to screens, to smartphones. And on top of that, the whole business model of the internet was entrenched in this idea of getting things for free and using our time as a resource. So we never really made this autonomous decision of reflecting, not do we want the screen, I mean, this is not about going back to the 20th century, but what kind of balance do we want between our online life and our offline life? So that's one uh, way in which our autonomy was affected. Now, another definition of autonomy is as a means to an end. The idea is that if we have autonomy, we're going to make better decisions for ourselves. This is used a lot in the health uh, care uh, context. So if we look now, I would say there were lots of studies coming out for over a decade, but over the last two or three years, the data is very, very clear, especially about children. And I'll talk uh, about all of it, but I want to emphasize what's, what's the data that's out there for children. So first of all, the impact on cognitive development, psychology studies, and on top of that, brain imaging studies show the impact of excessive screen time in many kids fall into this category on uh, um, cognitive development, learning, reading. And if you compare the scans of the brains of kids who are uh, basically exposed to excessive screen time, it looks very different from the brain scans of kids who are not, and there's a correlation to the cognitive assessments results. And I want to emphasize, I'm not talking about toddlers. This goes all the way to 18. That's one thing. Mental health, there's been tons of publicity about that. Again, there was a big debate. There has been an increase in anxiety, depression, and suicide rates since 2010. And there were all kinds of factors that people were bringing up. I think we're beyond that debate now that a lot of studies would show the correlation between the uh, social networks and smartphones and the increase. And in there's more granular studies showing especially the impact on girls. So that's another. There's also lots of concerning studies about attention. This affects adults as well as kids, but for kids, it's much worse. There are studies about uh, obesity. Now there's studies, and then that, that I think applies to everybody, showing the um, increasing disconnection, increase in hate, uh, because the algorithms that make people stay online for longer are the same algorithms that make them angrier. Uh, increase in um, basal, basic feeling of not feeling well, not feeling content. 
And these are the more, um, the, the less concrete studies, but there are studies, not just about kids and depression, but also about adults, how their well-being has been affected. So the question for autonomy is, had we known this in 2009, had we chosen that for ourselves? Okay, so I want to go back to my talks to parents. Uh, because as I said, I started 2017, and by 2018, something felt different to me. I, I just felt that the parents were desperate, they're feeling powerless, they've tried the self-help methods, and nothing was really changing. And at that point, I realized I needed to write a different book, a book that is not about the power of awareness, but a book that looks at how we can shift from failing internal battles with ourselves, each of us with our own computer, internal inter, uh, family battles at home, a way to uh, changing things in the public sphere. And the first thing I did, and that's really um, a big part of my book, I decided to look into the past because I was realized there was a similar narrative. And uh, when you look at the fight uh, against tobacco, the fat fights against uh, junk food, and later the fights to protect privacy, in all these situations, you have a corporation that is basically releasing a harmful product the truth starts trickling out and the corporations start using what I call the science wars and they start using legal strategies. And I spend a big part of the book trying to see what, which of these strategies are important to take forward to contain uh, technology addiction, technology overuse. And I'm not going to talk about all of them. I want to emphasize one of them, which I think is particularly important. <clears throat> and that is the um, idea of self-choice and personal responsibility. And uh, this is a strong cultural icon, the idea that we can choose for ourselves and we are responsible for our choices. And that is exactly what uh, the tobacco industry, the food industry, and maybe the top industry have been using. So I'll give some examples. When smokers started to sue the tobacco industry, they went to court and the tobacco industry argued, well, you chose to smoke, therefore you're responsible for the uh, lung cancer or the other health uh, consequences and eventually for death. And they actually, for decades, they won with this argument. Then there is the food awards. So the same thing happened. A group of teens decided to sue McDonald's in New York because they ate every day at McDonald's, they were obese, they suffered from diabetes. And again, McDonald's argued, well, the teens, they chose to eat McDonald's, nobody forced them. Nobody forced them to suicide their meals. So that they are responsible and, and not won this case. Not only that, the food industry went further. Half the states now have what's called cheeseburger laws. These laws basically provide that you cannot sue uh, the food industry for uh, any food problems, any health problems resulting from food. And the preamble in these laws is these laws are here to foster self-responsibility for people for their own health. Now, the tech industry has already been doing exactly the same. And game manufacturers who were at the forefront of the fights, when they were, they had to argue before the FTC. The FTC had a workshop about loot boxes and addictive feature in games. The first thing game manufacturers said, well, Gamers are the ones who want to play, so they or the parents are responsible. But the tech industry went further, and they basically provide us the tools to think that we are making the choices. So the tech industry came out with these digital well-being tools, and I'm sure you're familiar with them. 
If you have an iPhone, you have screen time, you can see how much time you spend on your screen. You have to have an option of uh, changing the settings so you will spend, uh, you will limit how much time you spend on a specific app. You can even turn your phone gray. If you go on Instagram, you can um, have these notifications saying you've spent too much time. You can turn it on for your child. You, uh, if you go on TikTok, you have videos, you're in control. So the thing is, and not to mention parent control, which never seemed to really work, but the tech industry has basically provided us tools that do not go to the core of the issues. They did not uh, eliminate the infinite scroll. They did not eliminate any of the many other addictive features. What they did was give us tools to make us feel that we have the choice we are responsible, and if, if we're unsuccessful, it's our fault. So, the what's interesting about the self responsibility argument when you study the past, and you can also see how it breaks. And in my book, I try to show also the um, places, the vulnerabilities of the arguments. There are several places where this argument breaks. I'll talk about two of them. And uh, one is when intent to addict is revealed. That's what happened with the tobacco companies for years won all the uh, lawsuits, but something shifted in the 1990s. Several things happened. But one of them was that evidence leaked from the tobacco industry that they knew that cigarettes were addictive and they were manipulating it, manipulating it. That was one thing. Now, we already have the evidence for technology because Frances Hogan, I think, had the most explicit uh, evidence when she testified before Congress and said that years ago, Facebook, which owns Instagram, basically had the information that Instagram was addicting users. They knew about the mental health problems. They knew the algorithms were basically there to make kids stay on for longer, and they made a decision. They made a decision to keep going and ignore it because that, otherwise the revenues would be, have been severely affected. So the evidence is already out there. The second place where the, where the personal responsibility argument breaks is with children, because we don't think about children who people as people who can make choices. We think of them as, people who aren't able to do that, who are not responsible. We are more willing to accept paternalistic solutions for children. Again, looking at cigarettes, you know, in most states, uh, kids under 21 cannot buy cigarettes. Doesn't mean they will not buy cigarettes, but some will still do that with far fewer will. Uh, we don't have these kinds of prohibitions for adults. Uh, for the fight against obesity, schools are required to uh, weigh kids and to um, send their BMI to their parents. You cannot imagine this happening at work. You cannot imagine going to work and having your employer weigh you and uh, sending your results somewhere. So there are lots of things that happen with children but do not happen for adults. And we're already seeing this. Most of the proposals to restrict especially social uh, networks are targeted at protecting children, partly because of the concerning public health verification, but partly because they're children. So the idea of the book is that we have to exert pressure in the public sphere in several ways. One is exerting pressure on technology companies to redesign their technologies. The other one is about changing how we use spaces, how we use technology in spaces. So I'll talk first of all about redesign. And there are many ways to do this, but I want to explain what I mean by redesign. So I'll give an example from the food area. So there's somebody called Fred Comomero. He, he passed away at the age of 100 and something. So Fred Comomero in the 1950s discovered that trans fat is bad. 
nobody listened for years. He published an article in Science Magazine in 1957, still nobody listened. Well, it took him decades, but what's interesting is what happened when actually, eventually, not just him, but other people uh, gave enough data to the FDA. The FDA in um, 2006 eventually required food companies to label the trans fats in the products. And six years later, there was a big change in trans fat levels. So what happened, consumers became aware of the issue. But even more importantly, food companies became aware it's actually a good thing to have zero trans fat on your product. So they started changing the composition of the food. So from 2006 to 2012, trans fat levels in blood tests of Americans went down 58%. So that's what I mean by redesign, exerting pressure so the product is changed. Now, there are lots of ways to exert pressure, uh, which I discussed in the book through class action legislation, but I want to give one example here. So let's talk for a second about Minecraft. So Minecraft is a game which was uh, sold as an educational game. Many, many parents I know regretted the moment they gave this game to their kids because they could not get the kids off. Now, imagine, now we know from uh, research on warnings that if the warning is very, very clear, very short, very blunt, but it's also at the point in which you have to make a decision, it's much more effective. So imagine if you parent had to download a game for a kid, but instead of having and um, just the age or violence, it actually set the level of addiction. You cannot imagine in parents they would download that game for the kid. What I predict would happen was, would be that the game companies would change some of the features, which are the most addictive ones, and the game will become less addictive. So that's an example of pressuring for redesign. I want to talk a bit about spaces. So, Spaces. Spaces can be, um, can be if you can design space for technology overuse. If any of you have been recently to any of the New York City airport, you cannot sit on a table without two to four iPads. You cannot have a conversation. You can only have space to, to read a book because there's no space. That's an example of designing for overuse. There are ways to design differently, and I want to talk about a really, really important space, and I think that's the classroom, because what I did in this book, I documented the legal movement that's already going on. I spoke to lawyers, but I want to emphasize that even though I interviewed lawyers in the book, this is not just a, le a legal thing. I think people can do a lot, and one place where people can do a lot is influencing school choices on the school level and on the district level. So the federal policy for technology in the classroom is the more the technology, the better. It's been the policy for over a decade. Now, the mega study did not find that more technology, technology actually taught kids better than teachers. Not only that, even the goal of bridging the gaps was not fulfilled through that. On top of that, we have tons of evidence of how screens are not good for kids, how kids don't learn well from screens. And there was some kind of status quo for a while because teachers didn't really want to adapt, adopt new teaching measures. So for a while, things were standing still, and then we got a pandemic, and teachers had no choice. So they started uh, adopting games, so they adopted Roblox and they adopted uh, Minecraft and they started posting the lectures on TikTok. And the pandemic is over, but teachers now teach in a different way. And it's important to understand that what happens in school does not stay in school because if Minecraft is schoolwork, then how can you tell your kid to get off Minecraft at home? If you're on screen for hours in school, your homework will be on screens as well. So 
there are so many points of change just thinking about how to use technology in the classroom. And I'll just, I'm giving this as some of the examples. So right now, the policy is maximizing technology, and more technology, the better. How about asking, is this specific technology better than the teacher? How about evaluating? Maybe it's good to have game quizzes because kids are more motivated, but maybe it's just more convenient for a teacher who doesn't have to grade. And are the kids really learning? These are decisions that have to be examined. Now, limiting screen according to age, it's clear that younger kids are affected more with screen time, and a lot of screen time is not good for anybody all the way to 18. There could be guidance for that. Um, now, evaluating existing technologies, we, at law schools, people always argue about laptops in law schools. I, I always allowed laptops because I, I could not read my own handwriting, so I thought I could not ban laptops, but I never ever understood why we have Wi-Fi. Why do I have to teach when my students are on Instagram or shopping on Amazon at the same time? Now, these are law students, but think about a middle school child or a high school child. How is the kid supposed to learn when at the same time they can go on TikTok? So evaluate, is the Wi-Fi classroom adding to the educational experience or detracting? Cell phones in school, France banned cell phones in school, not just in classrooms, but during recess because the kids were not talking to each other. In the US, some individual schools banned laptops in school. Sometimes they banned it as well in recess, but most schools didn't even evaluate it. So again, maybe kids need the cell phones because that makes them feel safe, they have a big connection to people, but maybe not, at least evaluate it. So the idea is that we have to stop blaming ourselves for failing and to target our energies somewhere else, shifting from our internal and home battles towards the public sphere. And I want to emphasize, by no way do I mean returning to a screenless, unconnected world. I just think we never, ever made a decision of what is the best balance for us. And I think we should, and maybe the pandemic gave the opportunity to think about whether we want to create a better balance. So thank you. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Uh, we'll now begin uh, a Q&A. So if folks in the room have any questions, um, Toby and I will pass around the mic. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the uh, interesting talk. Uh, so the, I, I'm a communication uh, professor, obviously, and I'm doing the research on mobile uh, video and all that. Although the empirical, the evidence is a bit mixed though, uh, so in the addiction side, uh, because if you actually uh, think about the cause of it and addiction as a time increase, but uh, we could think about different measure of the addiction first. And then uh, if the time increase actually leading to the difficult uh, outcome, then there is another uh, conditional variable we have to think about. Uh, so, because I think that that's more important, just uh, think about addiction in a way that time. Because again, as you mentioned at the last, uh, the part of the talk is that uh, because teenagers and kids actually uh, connect to, to the video game because they actually enjoy not only that, they actually increase their social capital. And then all your study in the social media actually increase of time actually has no impact on actually classroom, uh, you know, longing. So th there is a, some of the conflict, uh, the evidence, although, although I, I definitely agree that, uh, you know, uh, some of the problem actually exists so that uh, my, my question would be that a comment would be that how we actually find the nuanced uh, the argument in here, because as you said, uh, there's no way we could actually disconnect uh, from those kind of devices. Right, so thank you. So I think that there are two things here. There's the issue of whether it's time that's uh, creating the problem. So I think for social networks, there has been a lot of research 
and to see whether mental health is just a result of using social networks generally or whether it's more time. And the data does show that the people who are most affected were those who spend more time on social networks. Now, for games also, games, there's been, actually it's interesting because there's been more data than for, for anything else because there's been more research on this topic than, than social networks. And the data shows that uh, one to 9%, depending on the study, qualified for what the WHO uh, decided is a gaming addiction. So, and so here, um, whoever qualifies are people who are obviously spending so much time online that they're, the they're basically not uh, doing their other activities, they are failing out of school, they are not uh, going to work. So I think uh, there's definitely a, a relationship between people who qualify for clinical addiction to the time that they spend on, they spend on gaming. Hello, yeah, very interesting talk. In your talk, you mentioned about old parents feeling powerless. In my experience, I have come across two kinds of powerless parents. One, the rich people having just one or two kids, and since they want to pass away their heritage, so they, they feel powerless. If they have many children, they do not care about one child being rebellious. But at the same time, if the parent is poor, then if they depend upon the children for survival, for, for, then again, they feel powerless. So in what context did he mention about parents being feeling powerless? Okay, so I think that's a great question. So first of all, yes, obviously parents in certain environments have very serious problems to think about, and this may not be the first issue for them. They may be grappling with poverty, they may be grappling with crime, and these will be more on their mind. On the other hand, as I said, I ran an outreach program. Uh, I ran a program in uh, six schools in New York and New Jersey, and it was a broad spectrum of schools. So we had public schools in Newark, private schools in Manhattan. So yes, so maybe the, some of the parents in some of the public schools were less concerned, but the kids were affected. The kids were affected in the very same way. So it's it's true that some parents would think more about other issues first, but I don't think the problem is a class problem. The problem is a problem that affects all of us. Uh, hi, uh, thank you. Thank you for your interesting uh, speech. And I think this topic is also really important. Uh, I'm Wen, and as a father of two children, I really concerned about um, nowadays the uh, young children, they just live in this kind of environment. They are surrounded by the um, internet, computer, 3C product. And uh, as a as a parent, I, I also want them to have has the ability to access this kind of technology and uh, to have the connection with the, the, the social network. However, I don't want them to you know addict to the internet. So um could you provide provide us a, a better way to uh, find a balance between these um two sides? Thank you. I really appreciate your problem because I think you really express the, the, the difficult place parents are at. Because first of all, I think as a society, we believe that technology will promote progress. And parents, in a way, believe that the kids need technology to do well in life. On the other hand, they're seeing what's happening to their kids. They're seeing that they're not connecting, that they look tired, they're spending so much time in front of screens, and so they don't know what to do. So I think the goal is to redesign our technologies. I didn't talk about it so much in my talk, but I think there are certain principles that we could implement, because I think in a way our vision is narrow. We think about the technologies the way they are now. 
So we think, oh, if there will not be social networks, there'll be no free speech for kids. No, there could be other group um, connections online where kids can maybe connect without likes and comments. But there are certain things which are easier than saying all social networks have to do. There are certain, um, there are certain uh, designs which are addictive and are there for no reason but to get users back on the platform. And I think the most vital one from all of them is Snapstreaks. So Snapstreaks is a design on uh, Snapchat where a kid uh, gets a, starts a streak with a friend, they send their streak to a friend and within 24 hours, they get a streak back, they started a streak between them. Now they start counting the days and it goes on this chart on Snapstreaks. So you have 100, 123 days, 150 and they get special badges and they do it with all their friends. That's a popularity chart. Now you don't have to put anything in this street. You don't have to put a photograph. You don't have to put any content. The only goal of this thing is to get people back on the platform with Snapchat so they can see the ads. What happens if you don't? If you if kid misses one, it's all gone. This is devastating. Kids lose the whole chart of their friends. And that's why so many fights go on at home when the parents say, you did not do your homework, I'm taking your phone away. They didn't just take their phone away, they took their friends away. So, so there, are, and there are many designs like this, which are sort of, I would say, low hanging fruit. They are there for no good, but to keep us online for longer. But there's a bigger issue. And the bigger issue is the business model, just further than before, because as long as we have a business model in which time is a resource, there will always be new design to get us to stay there for longer. And I think and that's more time consuming. Eventually, this business model would have to change. And uh, there's antitrust measures against big tech, which could uh, create some change in the tech industry. For example, if Meta, which owns Instagram, Facebook, and WhatsApp, was broken up, we might eventually see more competition, more innovation, maybe different models like pay as you go, or we have some subscription models as it is. But this obviously takes time. So I think a big thing I have noticed and I wrote about in the book, it's not one thing. There's not going to be one magic, you know, Supreme Court case that will say, let's take all the addictive features away. There's going to be lots of action in many different venues that will change things. Um, we have a question from our virtual audience. Um, any thoughts about making smartphones illegal for anyone younger than 18 and allowing flip phones only for children younger than that? And the context um, is that uh, in America specifically, um, there is a lot of gun violence in schools and children need to be able to call their family. So I think the answer is not, does not go so far, but I think that's another one of the principles I discuss is we don't have something in the middle. We have flip phone for kids or we have smartphones which connect us to everything in which the default options are more connection and more notifications and limitless time. So I think if we had, in, and there are some, you know, some something called like a light phone, which gives you an option to only have some of the features like a Google map or, or an alarm and calls. But if, for example, Apple came up with a phone which would give you a middle of the way solution, I think parents would give it to their kids. Doesn't mean the kid has to be on you know, the internet, on social networks, on games, but the kids could find their way home, they could connect. We do not have something that's, that's really, really, um, a really good option right now. And, and, it, and there's a reason for that, because I don't think that Apple or Google want to give us really good options. Thanks a lot for your talk. I very much enjoyed it. I have a very, very specific question about a book that I read, um, Oliver Berkman's Time Management for Mortals. I'm not sure if you know the book. 
But um, I think in his book, he talks about business models which are contributing to that problem, but also the underlying urge of people to get distracted. So could you maybe comment on that as well? So I, don't, I did not read that specific book, but so I'm not sure which business model he is referring to. Could you give an example? So with business model, I mentioned just the role of um, corporations designing designing websites and apps in this addictive way. So he's just, I mean, his claim, yeah, so his claim is basically that, yeah, this exists. So these um, tools are designed in, in a way to make us addictive, but he claims that even when these tools are less addictive, we would still have this urge to seek for distraction and yeah, so. Right, so I think it's true. That's I think when I started out, I said that basically tech companies use our human vulnerabilities. The human vulnerabilities are there. I mean, we want to be liked. Teens have always wanted to be liked. But when you take the fact that teens want to be accepted and you put them on Instagram and they know where, what everybody is doing all the time and how great they look, it just makes things worse. Yes, yeah, so we always will have trouble paying attention. We'll always have trouble, you know, focusing when we need to. But right now, when I'm sitting there and I have three email accounts and I'm trying to check all these other things online, all these windows are open, that is, and my phone is beeping, that is making it a bit too much. So now we're never going to change completely who we are, but we've gotten to a point that who we are is changing, and that's part of the problem. Wonderful. Well, if there's no other questions, um, Professor Brunchen, do you, if you don't mind maybe sticking around and maybe folks might have additional. Um, but thank you so, so much. Thanks everyone for joining today. Um, maybe a last round of applause.